My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Annalise Cooper, Gita Madden, Craig Fortier, and Robin Letson. For a lot of people, spaces organized around sports often feel hostile, toxic, and unwelcoming. People may love the game, they may enjoy the activity involved, but all too often the culture permeating and surrounding sports accentuates some of the worst features of our social world and pushes people away. The details vary a lot with the specific sport, level of play, and location, but even in recreational contexts, this often includes toxic masculinity, hyper-competitiveness, hostility towards queer and trans people, and in some instances, fairly open racism. And the cost of fees and equipment can be a significant barrier as well. Given that context, people engaged in grassroots political work aimed in one way or another at collective liberation have a range of relationships to recreational sports. Some play, some don't. Some of those who don't are just not interested, while others stay away because of the hostility and exclusion already mentioned. And some are openly disdainful towards the entire enterprise. This disdain is often a response to the hostility and exclusion that people have experienced, but it also sometimes connects to the puritanical streak that exists in many movement contexts in North America that's not specifically about sports, but that carries a certain suspicion of fun and leisure and pleasure. Whatever individual relationships exist to sports, however, there's almost never thoughtful, politically-minded, collective engagement with sports as a possible terrain for living our lives and organizing our communities otherwise, and with a range of possible connections to broader struggles. Back in 2007, or thereabouts, a number of people connected with the Toronto chapter of the migrant justice group No One Is Illegal decided to start a softball team, as a way of bringing like-minded people together outside of the grind of meetings and rallies, but also separate from the more common alternative of bars and pubs. The team itself, called The Uncertainty, brought together both people who were part of radical grassroots political networks and people who were not, and they played in one of the mainstream corporate co-ed recreational leagues in Toronto. This sparked the beginnings of an ongoing collective conversation about the politics of recreational sports, and it was the start of a team that, with a continually evolving roster, played together for a decade. In 2017, a group of players on the uncertainty decided that among the network of current players, former players, and supporters that they had accumulated over those years, they had enough people to go from being a team in a mainstream league to starting their own league. They call it the Field of Dreamers Cooperative Softball Association, and today the four-team league is close to completing its second successful season. As they explain, they see Field of Dreamers as not just a great place to enjoy softball, but integrally as a radical political project. Annalise Cooper is a PhD student and a teaching assistant at York University, and an organizer in Indigenous sovereignty and settler solidarity, sexual assault advocacy, and labor struggles. Gita Madden is an educator with the Toronto District School Board, and an organizer working at the intersection of the criminal justice and education systems. Craig Fortier is an assistant professor in social development studies at Renison University College at University of Waterloo, as well as a migrant justice and indigenous solidarity organizer. And Robin Letson is a mental health worker, is active in LGBTQ communities in Toronto, and connects to other grassroots movements via editing and writing work. The four of them speak with me about the barriers and problems in many mainstream recreational sports cultures, and about the radical vision of the Field of Dreamers Cooperative Softball Association. And just a quick heads up that there are a couple of very brief stretches at the start of the episode where the audio echoes a bit. Don't worry, they don't last long at all, so please just keep listening. My name is Craig Forte. I'm an assistant professor at Renison University at University of Waterloo, but mostly organized within migrant justice and in support of Indigenous sovereignty struggles here in Toronto. 
and have been a real active baseball player my entire life, including playing in some pretty competitive and developmental baseball. And also was one of the founders of the Uncertainty Recreational Softball Team, which sort of evolved into what we have as the Field of Dreamers today. The Uncertainty played in the run-of-the-mill mainstream co-ed recreational softball leagues that you have all throughout the country. And what we were finding was it was very challenging to develop a culture that aligned with our political values within that space. And so the Field of Dreamers was a coming together of a bunch of us who are organizers in various political movements, but also who are folks who really love to play with each other. And this was an opportunity to try to develop something new that aligned our political visions with the act of playing sport. My name is Annalise Cooper, and I'm a PhD student at York University and a teaching assistant at York University. And I'm also an organizer in Toronto around Indigenous sovereignty and settler solidarity movements, sexual assault advocacy, and labor activism. And I'm also a player, a captain, and a member of the coordinating committee of the Field of Dreamers Baseball League. I played on the uncertainty team before the Field of Dreamers and was involved in coordinating the development of the league. My name is Geeta Madden. I teach high school with the Toronto District School Board, and my organizing work is mostly around issues of education, specifically the intersection of criminal justice and education, or the school-to-prison pipeline. I've been playing with the league for, this is my second season now. And I'm Robin Letson. I live in Toronto as well, where I am involved in two SLGBTQ communities and work as a mental health counselor. And I also play music and often connect to movement work through doing editing and writing work. I played on The Uncertainty with Craig when I moved back to Toronto a couple of years ago and then very excitedly joined the Field of Dreamers League when it came about last summer. Why don't each of you tell me about why playing softball is something that's important to you, but also what it is about how organized sports usually happen that make them often not a welcoming space to be in. I played softball as a kid, and that was my one connection to sport. I wasn't a very sporty kid at all and was often quite intimidated by those social contexts. So when I found out that there were folks with similar political values to mine who were playing together on a team. It was just a really exciting opportunity to have access to some kind of like physical activity and also just a community space and a chance to get to know people I didn't know well already. Softball and certainly the way that it manifests in our league is I think a sport that can hold folks who have various relationships to being physically active or to playing sports. I came to softball through mainly this team, but I also played on a co-ed softball league earlier in my life in my early 20s. But I was an athletic child and was comfortable in sport, played soccer in co-ed leagues really all my life. My experiences in those leagues, the co-ed leagues in particular, were usually quite fraught almost all the time. From the time I was six to the time I was 16, I felt the gender difference playing sports with mostly boys and being one of three to five women on the team and really experiencing our roles as filling a gender quota, at least in the eyes of our male teammates. That always really frustrated me being an athletic person and in a sport that I felt like I actually had a lot of skills in. And then the softball league that I first joined, I was really asked to join to fill their quota for women. I never felt comfortable in the sport of softball, but I played anyway, just so, you know, my friends could house a team without defaulting. And so there was a pressure to go, but never a pressure to build skills or be an equal contributor to the team. So a few years later, when I moved to Toronto and heard about the team that Craig was organizing and his philosophies behind balancing out those patterns that play out in all sorts of co-ed spaces for sports I was really excited at the opportunity to get back into playing sports, but in a space that was actively working to push against the parts of sports that can really be alienating and isolating for a lot of people. 
When I was growing up, I played sports in school, but never very seriously, and I was never very good, and never saw myself as much of an athlete. But then when I was in my early 20s, I came to realize that physical activity is really, really important for me, not only for my physical health, but also for my mental and emotional health. And so I've spent a number of years trying to find spaces that feel good, that feel supportive, where I don't already have to be good at something, but I can really have the space to develop my skills. And I also really gravitate towards doing pretty much everything in my life in community as much as possible. But most of the sports or athletic communities, they just haven't felt right. So this league has been really amazing to be able to play and to be able to run around and play sports with people while also being part of a really solid community that's really supportive and creates space for all sorts of different people to come together. My experience is a little different. I played really competitive baseball all through my childhood and really loved it. I love baseball. It's probably something that defines me more than most things in the world. But it was a struggle to play in travel baseball. It was a struggle to negotiate the fact that I have a father who's gay and he would come to watch all of my games and the amounts of homophobia and toxic masculinity that pervades baseball culture like it does in almost every sport culture was really a huge challenge and made me not want to be there, even though it was something I loved. And so I abandoned baseball for about five years of my life. And it was really challenging because it was the one place where I would go to sort of get my spiritual centeredness, I guess, in terms of physical activity. I was organizing what no one is illegal here in Toronto uh, around 2007, when we start to talk about the fact that oftentimes our congregation happens in rallies, at meetings, maybe in bars and pubs, but it never happens in structured and organized ways outside of those forums. And that can be really kind of draining and exhausting. So we decided that it would be a great idea to start a softball team. And because I had had experience playing baseball, I brought together as many people as we could at the onset and then supplemented them with friends of mine. And we had to negotiate that culture shock, right? We had to negotiate the culture shock between some of my pals who were just sort of bro dudes and these organizers known as illegal who weren't going to put up with that kind of behavior. That started to really light a fire in terms of thinking about this sport, this game that we're playing isn't just a recreational space that you're able to get away from the political organizing, but is inherently a political space itself. That was sort of the emergence of the Field of Dreamers. And I think something that really allowed us to start to imagine that space of play, not simply as a recreational space that political organizers can go to, but rather a incubator for thinking through and practicing and engaging in the types of political societies we wish to create. So we started in 2007. Over the years, we gained people through incredibly different ways. So for instance, one of the players in our league was somebody that through the baseball team itself, we helped to get out of immigration detention. We had people who were part of our league who weren't part of known as illegal, but were part of various organizations around say, mining injustice organizing or anti-capitalist organizing. And over about a decade, what we ended up seeing was that while every year we would register 13 people, we had this community, this network of people who had played on our team. And so we start to think and talk about, well, we have this community that we built and we built it along lines where we're one of the few teams in the city that doesn't work on the traditional gender binaries of co-ed baseball. We're one of the few teams in the city that really tries to emphasize the participation of non-cis male players. And we could try actually develop a league, not necessarily to isolate ourselves, but to maybe try to create a model that can be proliferated in other spaces. That was really the impetus for starting what became the Field of Dreamers Cooperative Softball Association. So how does the Field of Dreamers League work differently than a mainstream recreational softball league? When we organized the league, we figured we could bring together four teams. To decide on who played on what teams, we decided to organize that through self-identified skill level. We gave people four categories to choose from, which was beginner, 
intermediate experienced. And then the final category of mentor, which we defined as wanting to step up and also share your skills. There's a huge emphasis on learning, on sharing skills, and on bringing to each game and to the field what you have, but also thinking about what you can bring to the other players. So our mentors are expected to take a role in encouraging beginners and anyone learning more skills to provide a supportive environment. And we all play a part in providing a supportive environment for our co-players and for the other teams as well. So as opposed to thinking about does each team have this amount of cis men or this amount of women or this amount of whatever, we could care less about gender distribution. It's about distributing a good amount of skill across the teams so that there'll be a good level of competition, but also fairness. We have skill shares throughout the league. And we have written rules in certain ways to really emphasize fairness to newer players, development of skills. And we really prioritize the guiding principles of the league, which see softball as a community and not as just individual skill. We prioritize letting people play their positions as opposed to playing on top of them just to make that play. It's not that we don't all care about winning because I think we do, but we want to be giving everybody all the opportunities to play and learn and to share in that experience of play. We really came to this idea of having to develop a league through the city bureaucracy, which was a real challenge. You know, the first time we put in the application, we actually were rejected for a softball diamond because the competition is so fierce in the city of Toronto for access to public space. But we really fought back against that because we had seen all the posts and ads for these large corporate leagues like the Toronto Sport and Social Club who hold permits for all kinds of diamonds. And yet community-based leagues are supposed to be prioritized by the city, but we were being rejected. So we actually started a phone and email campaign that was really successful. But in the sense of securing the diamond, we were also really struggling. A lot of us work with Indigenous communities and some of our players and people who are coordinating the league are Indigenous people themselves. And we had this contradiction at hand, which is that oftentimes non-Indigenous people can mobilize to access public space. And yet we don't recognize the inherent contradictions of playing on stolen land. And so because baseball is a sport that is really rife with like tradition and protocols and decorum and all these things, we thought it'd be really interesting to sort of mess with that. So we hold an opening ceremony and a closing ceremony every season where we actually do a long standing land acknowledgement. Gilbawana Say, who is one of the players in the league, suggested that one of the ways we could do that is through putting tobacco down at home plate. And so each game, no matter what the ceremony is, somebody comes out and puts tobacco down. And we do a lot of conversations and talking within the league and in the coordinating committee of how to make those intentions actionable outside of the diamond. We try to ensure that everybody who plays in our league and even anyone who's a spectator really can see this happening and be engaged in the conversation over it. The second thing is around access to space in a financial way. The city of Toronto has become more and more unlivable. And for many people, one of the first things you cut out is recreational sport. Because we're cutting out the middleman, basically the Toronto Sports and Social Club and all these other corporate leagues that pay the same fees that we do for the diamonds, but are able to then charge massive premiums to people. We're able to offer registration in the league on a sliding scale, including people who will sometimes just pay double their registration fee so that we can offer spaces for players who don't have to pay at all. And the idea here is to ensure that whoever wants to play in the league is able to play so long as we have space for players. People who have played the year before have first dibs on the next season. But then when those spots open, we make sure that we prioritize people, you know, cis female or non-binary folks, people who are from racialized communities, Indigenous folks, and people who may not be able to afford recreational sports otherwise. So I'm speaking as a player, not as a member of the organizing committee. For me, what makes this league really special is that It feels like there's a really deep ethic of care that underpins everything that happens. I actually think the entire league in itself is an act of collective care. There's just so much intentionality in every decision that's made. 
everything from the rules and how we try to balance out skill levels on the teams and things like that, but also just in all of the interactions that happen on the field as well. So we'll often give extra hits to beginners that might have otherwise struck out or the way that we stop the game if there happens to be an injury and everyone kind of tends to it and make sure that that person is good. And even in the relationships that we've developed with some of the fans that come and watch our games, I feel like we all have this sense of responsibility to each other and to the league because we know that we're creating something really beautiful and something different. Yeah, I can't agree more with what Gita just expressed as a player who comes out every Sunday and really reaps the benefits of the hard work that folks on the coordinating committee have done to create a culture of care and of a lot of intention around creating something new rather than replicating the structures that we have all experienced, particularly in the context of playing sports in the mainstream. So this is woven in and out of all of the things you've said so far. But talk a bit more explicitly about why you see Field of Dreamers not just as a great place to play ball, but as an important political project. When we're building in like political mobilizations, when we're organizing campaigns and we're organizing rallies and we're organizing really important and urgent radical actions, We really struggle, I think, as the organized left with the way we treat each other, the way in which we support each other, how we build each other's skills, how we build each other's capacities to do things on our own so that all the work doesn't fall on the shoulders of those who are, quote unquote, most capable, right? And so I think one of the things that we've seen through this league is that it is a lower stakes way of practicing this within our community. But the other is that this gives us a real opportunity to intervene in the realm of sport in a way that oftentimes the radical left abdicates or abandons. That we're not just intervening in terms of like the professional levels, which are really important. And, you know, it's important to protest racist logos. But there's this culture in sport that permeates even at the lowest levels, at the most fun levels that should be just recreational. And this is our opportunity to intervene in this and not just to intervene, but to find a way to push for its proliferation. So we had this really exciting thing happen this season where people who organize a similar league under similar values in Montreal were getting pushed off of their field by the mayor of Montreal. And the field was actually bulldozed. And they reached out and we were able to do a letter writing campaign in support of them to do a video that was sent to the mayor's office and to also sort of continue this ongoing relationship building in which one of the organizers of that league came to Toronto for a weekend and played in our league to build those relationships. And so I think for me, the political value of what we're doing isn't just peripheral, but central to the ethos of the league. For me, I don't see the kind of care, the acts of care and intentionality that we've built into the fabric of the league as separate from politics. To me, doing a leftist and a progressive politics is as much about the process as it is the goals and the outcome. And I've really learned a lot in the process of being a part of this team, being a part of the organizing committee, and taking the time to really have difficult discussions with each other and make decisions that are sometimes difficult. When we were playing as the uncertainty in the Toronto Social Sports Club, we were demonstrating that as a model to other teams. And a lot of times they just weren't getting it. We'd be playing against teams who were so competitive that they would be making fun of each other, putting each other down. We saw a lot of ugly behavior. And in modeling against that, some teams did come up to us and say, wow, like you guys seem to all really care about each other. It kind of shocked them to see that sport could be done in that way. We do that a little bit less by virtue of being in our own league now, but we do have a lot of spectators. A lot of them engage with us. And if there's somebody like heckling us, we've taken the time to actually have conversation with those people who are bystanders and be able to communicate what this league is about and why we're doing it. So I think there's more opportunities we can build that we could actually continue to get more people to think about transforming sport and using our example as just one model of potentially, hopefully there can be a lot more models out there. There's just so few right now, but I think that part of our work to continue that on will be doing outreach, 
But yeah, to me, it really does come down to those relationships that we've built that are political, that also carry us through the political work that we do outside of softball. The other area of growth I hope for our league is to see players who have experience in our league or who have played in our league to go off and take these relationships and the politics of care elsewhere and to put it into other parts of their lives and their work and maybe even start their own leagues or teams. Personally, as someone who spends a lot of their time in the nonprofit world and kind of feeling a lot of existential angst in that world as someone with radical political values, the League is a space to literally just connect, to find out what is happening in terms of organizing in the city, to lend solidarity to the organizing work that folks are doing, and yeah, to build relationships in real life, in real time. It may sound simple, but that's been a vastly important aspect of the League for me. I think that as organizers, a lot of us are just really hustling to get by in this very expensive city and, you know, do good work and do good organizing and also all of the other forms of labor and care and support that many of us take on, particularly women of color. And I think if we don't actively create spaces that nourish us and inspire us and keep us going, then those spaces just don't exist. And it's hard for this work to be sustainable if we're not being fed, because often organizing spaces can be quite toxic and draining. So I think that it's just really, really important for us to be intentional about creating spaces like this. I also think that we don't give ourselves enough room for fun in organizing spaces and to just play. And we're constantly dealing with such serious issues all the time. I do think it's really important for us to spend time sort of like playing together and laughing and relating to each other in different ways. And that's part of what this league gives me as well. Doing that not only strengthens our relationships within the league, but it also strengthens our political work that goes beyond the baseball diamond itself. So I feel like what we've created really feeds into our political movements beyond the league as well. You have been listening to my interview with Annalise Cooper, Gita Madden, Craig Fortier, and Robin Letson from the Field of Dreamers Cooperative Softball Association. To learn more about Field of Dreamers or to get inspired to start your own radical recreational sports project, go to fieldofdreamers.org. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week. <laughs>